The title of today's message is A Second Look. Uh, you can't be on social media at all hardly without the gold diggers. Does anybody know what I'm talking about on the gold diggers? So there's these videos, these guys walking down the street, some hot girl comes up and he approaches her and tries to get her attention. She's got a boyfriend, uh, not getting the time of day. And he goes, okay. And then he walks around and he gets in some really expensive car. And all of a sudden, hey, 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 she's back. Just broke up with her boyfriend, like in the last two seconds. And she's interested in him because of the car. Like, well, maybe he's got a car, maybe he's got money, and now maybe I'm interested. A second look, a uh, little twisted, but it's a real thing. <clears throat> Tony Romo. Uh, if you know the story, he played Eastern Illinois University and went undrafted in 2003. Um, was still considered a commodity, undrafted. Still considered a commodity after the draft, the Cowboys signed him and three, had a three year stint as backup quarterback becoming, before becoming a starter. Uh, three pro, three uh, pro Bowl appearances, holds a team record I think still for the most touchdown passes. So they took a second look, turns out to be a good thing. Kurt Warner, even a movie about Kurt Warner. Now listen to this, undrafted NFL player, uh, maybe the most overlooked player of all time, uh, took a job stocking shelves in a grocery store for five fifty dollars an hour, because he thought his career was over, played arena football, Missed tryouts with the Bears because of a spider bite. Um, ended up playing for the, Ad the Amsterdam Admirals and then back to the U.S. Uh, I think he played for the Rams, New York, St. Louis Rams, New York Giants, Arizona Cardinals. And uh, third string quarterback, second string quarterback. Ended up AP NFL MVP twice, NEA NFL MVP three times, Pro Bowl selection four times, Super Bowl champ, Super Bowl MVP. Uh, somebody took a second look. So here's my question for you today. What if you got the answer to the biggest question of your life wrong the first time around? Would you be willing to take a second look and possibly reconsider if given that opportunity? So whether you're in this room or you're listening or watching out there, and if you're here, you're here, but if you're watching or listening out there, then here's a couple of things that could be going on. Either you just found this program, or someone literally might have sent this message to you because it's for you. And they've been praying for you, and it appears that you passed on Jesus the first time around. And they're praying that you will take a second look. Now this is also for Christians who appear to have passed on Jesus, and I can't even tell you how many people like this I come across. I'll ask them, well, are you a Christian? No, I say, well, tell me about your upbringing. Then it turns out when they were a kid, they went to a vacation Bible school, they went to, some, to church with some friend, they didn't grow up in church maybe, but somewhere along the way, they made a commitment. And if you really nail them down, they say, well, yeah, I, at that time I believed, I don't believe anymore. Now let me give you some really good news. If you ever believe, you can't stop believing. Uh, Jesus don't move in and move out. So if you ever moved him in, he didn't move out. You say, well, I'm living like hell. Well, he's having to live with you. Well, I'm never going back. And maybe today's for you. Because maybe you are going back. Let's start in Luke 15. And I'm not going to read you this whole story, one of my favorite chapters in the whole, in the whole Bible. And my contention with Luke 15, it's, uh, it's the, the chapter includes... Uh, a story about a lost sheep, lost coin, and then a lost son. Some refer this, to this as the prodigal son. Go down to verse 11. Then he said a certain man had two sons. So let me just point this out, and I've heard this different ways. But I read here he had two sons. 
So that means this boy did not become a son later. He was a son when he left the house. Two sons, the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided them his livelihood. He said, I'm tired of waiting for you to die. Give me my portion. And not many days after the younger Son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. But when he had spent all, there arose a famine, a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. He's in trouble. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said... How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to and to spare, and I perish with hunger? So let me just let me just stop here. Whatever you think you traded Jesus in on, it ain't worth it. And if you ever got Jesus, and he and, and he's been riding along, maybe you got him in the trunk, but he's in the car. And you're trying to shut him up and tell him to leave you alone. And yet you are under conviction. The Holy Spirit's working on you. And you say, well, I I don't want to, I don't want him. I don't want to live that way. He, He did me wrong. How many people I talk to that say, well, God let my wife cheat on me. My husband cheat on me. Something like a kid died, whatever it was, something terrible happened and I'm out. The problem is he's not out. And so... I don't really know all, I don't understand all I know about this, but for whatever reason, he will let it ride sometimes for a very long time. And you can end up in a really bad place, and sometimes the reason that we end up in really bad places are for moments like this. No one was helping him. He was in want. And finally he says, my father. My father's servants have it better off than me. And he starts to rehearse in his brain I should go home. Do not let pride get in the way of you going home. Verse 18, I will arise and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And then the whole story changes on verse 20, and he arose and came to his father. He did it. I'm asking you today to consider taking a second look and look at your situation. You heard about Jesus, maybe you accepted his payment in your behalf and then you went out, I'm gone, I'm out of here. I'm gonna live like I wanna live, I'm gonna do what I wanna do. I don't wanna, I want a savior, I don't want a Lord, I don't want anybody bossing me around and you know what, I don't, I don't even really want, I wanna be hypocritical, so I don't even want a savior anymore. To hell with me, to hell with him, I'm out. You meet more of these people than you realize. Jesus is in there. You say, well, I can't see that light. You put that light under a bushel, nobody can see it. A lot of Christians all bushled up too, though. People, religious people, can't see that light either. A rose came to his father. And it says when he was still a great way off, his father saw him, had compassion, ran, fell on his neck, and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight, no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his hand, sandals on his feet, bring the fatted calf here, kill it, let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to be merry. I'll let you go read the story of the older brother. Um, but a party breaks out when a son comes home. Uh, you can't come here very long and leave from here and come back and not have this experience. I don't know who you are. I don't know where you are. Maybe you're back today. But if you walk back in this door and your heart has changed, I don't care where you've been, what you've done, you'll get a hug and a kiss and we're glad to see you. At least the people who clapped will be. Um, everybody else like, oh, not so much. Um,
After you take a second look, this is part of the process sometimes. You go, you know what? I should have stayed home in the first place. So for anybody thinking about taking off on Jesus, you're like, well, I just don't, I, you know, I'm missing out. The world's doing all this stuff. I'm, I'm missing out. I'm, I'm going to go have a good time. You're, you may have a quote unquote good time, but I'm going to tell you, you're burning, you're burning wick. You only got so much wick in that candle and you are burning it up just like crazy. And if you do finally come to yourself, which I think Jesus has a way of finishing what he starts, I believe that, that you'll go, wow, Lord, I only got so much wick left. What did I do? I don't know, but what are you going to do? What are you going to do with what you got left? Go to Luke 23. So this is a little bit buried in the story here, uh, and I like that kind of stuff in the Bible. So Jesus is arrested. He's going to be beaten, tried, bogus trial. The Jews who are supposed to be acknowledging him as Messiah, they, they want him dead. And go to Luke 23, 32. Uh, they got him out to the, to the place of the skull where they're going to crucify him. And verse 32 says, there were also two others, criminals, led with him to be put to death. And when they had come to the place called Calvary, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right hand and, and the other on the left, which I find very fascinating. Uh, they could have put Jesus on either side and put one of the, the criminals in the middle. Something about that picture, two criminals and Jesus in the middle of them. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And they divided his garments and cast lots. And the people stood looking on, but even the rulers with them sneered, saying, he saved others. They're mocking him on the cross. He saved others. Let him save himself. If he's the Christ, the chosen of God. Verse 36, the soldiers also mocked him, coming and offering him sour wine and saying, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. And, the, and, and an inscription also was written over him in, in uh, letters of Greek, Latin, and Hebrew, this is the king of the Jews. Now, uh, just hold that and listen to this verse. This is over in Matthew 27 and verse 44. Even the robbers who were crucified with him reviled him with the same thing. So you've got these three men go to be crucified, and they're all strung up on crosses and and the people at the foot of the cross are mocking and these two thieves at one point both of them are mocking him then go back to Luke 23:39 then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him saying if you are the Christ save yourself and us but the other answered answering rebuked him saying do not do you not even fear god seeing you're under the same condemnation and we indeed justly for for we receive the due reward of our deeds but this man has done nothing wrong within minutes one of these thieves goes from mocking jesus to he's the guy a second look pretty quick Keep reading. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Now it was about the sixth hour and there was darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour and the sun was darkened and the veil of the temple was torn in two. And when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. So when the centurion saw what had happened, he glorified God saying, certainly this was a righteous man. Now the centurion and some of these soldiers are taking a second look. Over to Matthew 27 again, verse 54. So when the centurion and those with him, not just the centurion, those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and the things that had happened, they feared greatly saying, truly this was the son of God. So these soldiers even, they have discounted him. He's nobody, he's nothing. It's, it's the Messiah. And then with a matter of no time, they've reconsidered, taken a second look and said, glorifying God, saying certainly this was a righteous man or truly this was the son of God. 
You can be one minute crucifying Jesus and minutes later saying, he's my guy. Uh, be careful throwing sinners away. Uh, I meet some people who've done some pretty jacked up things. Um, and I'm still kind of processing this too personally. So the scripture talks about we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. I see and hear and talk to enough people who have done things that I, I won't even repeat out loud. Uh, what, what human beings can do to other human beings or to themselves is just mind-blowing. It is just straight-up evil. But if you go, if, if, if people are not your primary problem, then you go to the demonic, the principalities, the powers, the rulers of darkness. If the people aren't the real problem, then who is behind that evil? It is abject evil. So you say, well, there's God and there's the devil and the devil made me do it. And we talk about the devil like he's just some guy in a, in a costume and, you know, trying to make a little trouble. I'm talking about evil, steal, kill, destroy. They want you. They want your marriage. They want your children. They want your grandchildren. They want anything they can get their claws into uh, and, and destroy your life in the worst way possible. And, and I, you know, I know a few guys that hunt and fish, and, and that's all about, in many cases, especially the fishing, it's all about lures, right? It's lures. It's disguising the hook so that you can deceive your prey, and then boom, you got them. It's, it hell, it's all hell's about. It's deception. It's lies. It's coming at you with beautiful worms and things that appeal to you, and then you take the bait, and bam, you're, you're out, and yet God on the other side is, is infinitely opposite in terms of his goodness. No evil, holy, pure, on your side, wants to be on your inside. And yet we take the bait and, and go the world's way because we want to do what we want to do. And sometimes that desire even comes out of a religious motivation. There are a lot of people throughout history, and we're about to go into this one. Acts chapter 7. A lot of people in history have done evil things in the name of God. Um, so don't throw sinners away. I can remember before Saddam Hussein died, I figured they were going to get him. And I found myself praying that someone would get to Saddam Hussein and share the gospel with him. And you say, well, what are you crazy? To hell with him. I hope he burns in hell. Be careful on, with that. Like, well, but what, look what he's done. Look at who he was, the atrocities. You, you just don't want to go there. You say, well, I'm not evil like that. Well, how evil are you? Are you evil enough to have gotten Jesus crucified in your behalf or, or, or do you have some kind of exemption that Jesus died for the whole world but he didn't have to die for me because I'm not evil. I got no sin. You got one drop of sin or the whole bucket's full of poison, you're up. So this is where it gets really weird. It's, you think, well, it's all about his grace and his mercy and his goodness. No, it's not. Not if you don't need him. Well, I kind of need him, but not like he would. Luke chapter 7, verse 54. This is uh, Stephen preaching. I'm sorry, Acts. See, I just seen if y'all are listening. <laughs> Acts. Acts and you shall receive. <laughs> that is so terrible. Terrible. That's terrible, Chad. Terrible. 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 Acts 7, 54. This is Stephen's preached his sermon. And it was all good till he called him out. And verse 54, when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed at him with their teeth. 
But he, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. I don't know if Jesus gets up for everybody, but wow, what a cool thing. Because it says he's ascended into heaven and seated at the right hand of the Father. Well, what's he, what's he, what did he get up for? And said, look, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears, ran at him with one accord, and they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. So Saul, people say, well, he changed, God changed his name to Paul. There's nowhere in the Bible that says anything about that. That is not true. He's referred to Paul later, and he's referred to Saul later. I know that pops and bubbles, but go find it. I'll be happy to talk to you. Acts chapter 8, verse 1. Now Saul was consenting to his death, talking about Stephen. At that time, a great persecution arose against the church, which, is, which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Interesting how God, Jesus says, you know, going to all the world, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the other most parts of the earth, you think, well, they, I guess they went. They had to go. They got persecuted. What if they don't go? They're going. Sometimes the very thing you wish wouldn't come in on you, God has to use to get you moving. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. If you're a Christian at this time in the early church, um, I promise you there had to have been somebody praying to hell with Saul. I hope he burns in hell. This guy is a nightmare. He's wreaking havoc. He's going house to house, getting us arrested. God, do something to him. Take him out. Ever wish evil on an evil person? Therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. Turned out for the good. Look at Acts chapter 9. So apparently Saul's first look didn't turn out so good. He's decided that these Christians are wrong. They are bad. This Jesus apparently is bad. And he's going to put a stop to it. And he's got Gamaliel. He's got the Sanhedrin. He's got the, all the religious forces behind him authorizing him to do exactly what he's doing. He is a terrorist of sorts. Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus. So if he found any who were of the way, that's what they called it, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. So enough of just doing Jerusalem. Let's, let's, let's go to Damascus. Let's go hunt these Christians down out there and we'll arrest them and bring them back to Jerusalem. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Now, I don't want to get too far off on this, but for the people who come to me and say, well, what about the people who have never heard? Number one, according to Romans 1, those people don't exist. Romans 1 talks about people being without excuse. Number two, if someone acknowledges God, acknowledges that the, the sun can't be God, the moon can't be God, something they've carved can't be God, and they go, there's got to be something bigger, and they cry out to God, he will show up. He may send a missionary. He may send an angel. He can, he can write it in the sky, and Jesus can speak to him. And if you talk to Muslims nowadays, a lot of Muslims getting saved, and, and some of this is traceable, that Jesus is showing up in their dreams. Do not be limiting what God can do to reach somebody. But be willing to be the person. So now he hears this voice, and he said to him, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It's not a bunch of Christians, it's me. You think you're chasing them down. When you go after them, you go after me. Uh, I used to try to explain this to my girls when they were young, and they would say something not, not exactly right. 
to their mom and I would try to remind them that when you mess with her, you are messing with me. Do not mess with your mother or I'm coming for you. That sounds a little scary just saying it, didn't it? Yeah, there we go. Right? Yeah, and they knew I wasn't kidding. You don't mess with my wife. Jesus feels the same way about his bride. You mess with the bride, you're messing with the groom. So Saul's attacking the church, those of the way. And Jesus says, you're not going after them, it's me. Why are you persecuting me? I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. Um, some translation, kick against the pricks. But that word's taken on a whole nother meaning, so you don't even know what translation to use anymore. So um, the goads, uh, it's a pretty interesting thing. Um, and this is still a thing. The farmer who had oxen, let's say, pulling a plow, he had a stick with a metal spike on the end of it. And he would goad the, the ox or the oxen the direction he wanted to go, keep them moving. Well, if the oxen got rebellious and upset, the oxen would kick backwards and make it worse because when he kicked backwards, it would impale him on the goad. And so Jesus says to Saul, dude, you're kicking against the goad. You're, you're, you're making this worse on yourself. You're fighting me and I'm trying to help you. Then the Lord said to him, arise and go into the city. Uh, no, go, go, go to, um, why are you kicking in, uh, against the goads? So he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Then the Lord said to him, arise and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no one. Then Saul arose from the ground and when his eyes were opened, he saw no one. But they led him by the hand and brought him to Damascus. Didn't take him back to Jerusalem, took him to Damascus. And he was three days without sight and neither ate nor drank. Now, you say, well, if Jesus showed up, I might take a second look. What if he already has? What if he already has showed up? He's already shown up. You say, what do you mean? I haven't heard any voices. Nobody said anything about goads to me. So this is for anybody that's willing to take a second look. When he shows up, you will know it. You may not like it, and you may not want to do the right thing, but I promise you when he shows up, you will know it. Number one, you cannot become a Christian without him showing up. Not possible. You do not just all of a sudden one day go, I think I'll believe this, this philosophy, I'll believe this religion. If you become a Christian, it's because the Holy Spirit of God has come to you and, and you have been given faith to believe and you respond with that miraculously and you are born again. You say, oh, no, I, I decided that. I hate to tell you, you don't... You don't pick him, he picks you. We do not love him because we loved him first. We love him because he loved us first. Now, short of getting down on my hands and knees and crying and begging you, I am imploring you, if he shows up, take a second look. Because whatever you're holding on to, wherever you're trying to take it by yourself, it's not going to end well. You say, well, it's going good now. I'm sure the prodigal son had a, a little run there where it looked like it was going well. I recommend going home before it gets really rough. Just going home. Look around. Are they treating you better than your father? No. Do they care for you? No. No. When you're buying everything, you got friends. When you stop buying everything, do they still stay around? No. When you get in trouble, are they there? No. Go home. You say, but 
But I'm going to have to admit that I'm wrong. That's repentance. That's saying, Lord, I changed my mind. When I became a Christian, I changed my mind, and I decided you were better than what I had. And then I repented of repenting and decided, no, my way is better than your way. And I feel pretty stupid. That's why there's so many tears sometimes when you go home. Because it's humbling. It's humiliating. You determined to prove that you had it all figured out and your way was better. And turns out dad was right. But he let you go. Because when you come home, he wants you to stay. And if you're not a Christian... And he shows up, and this is how it works. You'll know it's him. Don't let the enemy who's trying to destroy your life here and in the hereafter tell you, well, if you, if you trade me in and this in for him, you're going to end up with nothing. If you keep what you're holding on to, you'll end up with nothing because it's nothing. Well, somebody told me about Jesus years ago when I was a kid. I heard about that, but you know, I've moved on. Take a second look. Um, you'd be amazed. Father, thank you so much for your word. Uh, I know you're working, and wherever this has gone, and whoever's here in these scriptures, and these people in the scriptures who gave you a second look and their whole lives or their eternity was changed. And all these people we've read about are dead. But the ones that changed their mind, those that repented are in heaven with you right now. So first of all, Lord, for anybody who is not a Christian, they've had people talk to them and literally you have shown up. Your kindness, your gentleness, has brought them to a place of repentance. And you have not given any of us what we deserve, but have extended mercy and grace. I pray that today, Lord, somebody, a bunch of somebodies, would say, God, it is embarrassing, it's humiliating, but I'm in a bad place and nobody cares about me. And it sounds like you care about me because you showed up. And so I'm going to trust you. I don't know exactly where it'll take me, but I know it'll take me to heaven for one thing and that you won't leave me. You'll, you'll help me get through this life and that would be better than doing it by myself. So I admit that I'm a sinner. I need you. I need your forgiveness. I believe that Jesus died on the cross, shed his blood, was buried and raised from the dead to offer me eternal life, abundant life. I'm in. I accept. Come live in me. Come live through me in the person of the Holy Spirit. And confirm that you've moved in, Lord, by filling the void, the empty, that only you can fill. Thank you for loving me and for coming after me and sending so many people along the way to help me get to you. And Father, for people who, if they were truly honest with anybody else, you already know, at some point maybe in their life, they said yes to you. And then they bolted. And they've bought the lies, they've tried to make it work the world's way and stuff you down there someplace. I pray that today they would take a second look and say, Lord, is this really working out my way? And come to their senses and go home. In their heart first, in their mind first, and then physically go home. And, and, and engage again, if, if not if it's never happened before, Lord, in a life of community, of family, of discipleship, of walking with other believers, and living a life of the truth, the way, the life you intended. Uh, I thank you for granting repentance, Lord. and the lives that are being changed even now. We love you, we thank you, we praise you, we trust you, and uh, we need you. And we pray it all in Jesus' name who makes it possible. 
Amen.